Hi guys, this is Tanya Hino with Hawaii Homes by Tanya with Century 21 I Properties Hawaii. And today we have a very special guest who happens to also be a very, very good friend of the family. And his name is Lopaka uh, Nsiong. My formal name is Jonathan L. Nsiong and the L stands for Lopaka. So all my good friends and acquaintances, family and Tanya, which he is one of, uh, uh, I am known uh, as Lopaka. Went through law school uh, uh, with my best uh, colleagues, uh, knowing that that name as well. So um, I uh, operate out of the law office of Jonathan L. Lin Siong, uh, which is a limited liability law company. And I am the sole member manager, attorney member manager. And um, yeah, so I'm uh, real glad to be here to, with you today. So Lopaka. Or should I just call you Jonathan? Call me, Lo call me Lopaka. <laughs> How you got into that? What's you your know, story? How did you get started? Okay, well, um, I'm truly a son of son of Hawaii. And uh, uh, I uh, was born and raised in a sleepy little town in central Oahu called Wahiowa. And I come from a really large family. I mean, I'm talking huge. And so uh, I'm uh, 11th child out of 11 brothers and sisters. And so I grew up with that idea of really having strong, real uh, traditional family values, okay, relationships. I grew up in a town where um, you, you knew your neighbors more as aunties and uncles versus Mr. and Mrs. And right. so relationships are really strong. Everyone knew everyone. And that's how it was, you know. And I, I think uh, uh, we come a little bit away from that, even in Hawaii. Uh, we got influenced by all the information and trends that's going on around the world, which is it's part of it's the nature of, of, of how things progress. <clears throat> but those traditional values, I think, are really at the root of anyone who comes from here and the family values. And so that idea of legacy, yeah, your family, your genealogy, your generations that come through. And so uh, we grew up uh, especially uh, knowing that, you know, if you come from Hawaii, and, and, you know, I don't, I, I will say this too, though. I don't, it's not really just because you come from Hawaii. I think every, it's true wherever you are, uh, that your family is very important. And um, uh, that uh, those relationships are the ones that sustain you, you know, when everything else kind of goes on the side. So with that background, uh, understanding that I never had any real, model or idea or goal to want to go into the legal profession, which is what I ultimately uh, ended up doing. Um, my brother and sister, I, was, I have seven sisters, okay? So you can imagine how our family meetings went with seven sisters <laughs> and just four boys. So me being the youngest, I had to really always uh, make my point short and succinct. So why did I become an attorney? Because they're not short and succinct, right? <laughs> As you like to point out. Anyway, um, so the idea of wanting to become a, going into the legal profession was, really was planted by one of my sisters a while back because uh, she always said, you know, I was basically real good at arguing my point. And still, that, that didn't equate to a legal profession for me or being an attorney. Um, but ultimately, as things happen, as soon as I finished my undergrads, I decided that I, I, uh, I had this calling. Okay. There's a lot of stuff that go behind there. And if you ask any attorney why they went into law school, there's a lot of idealism that probably was at the root of there. So I like no, it was no different with me. Uh, so being from a large family, I saw all the different, different types of issues that came up. Um, in a large family through all different generations. Because my parents were older, I had uh, a, a front row seat really as to end of life decisions, okay? And uh, I saw many aunties and uncles, my grandparents, I uh, being the youngest, um, I saw this stuff go on in front of me. So this idea of what happens when you become disabled, what happens when uh, you die, uh, they're very real to me. It's not a theory. It wasn't a practice type of session that you, you play out in school. 
these are real uh, issues that came up. And uh, so when I went to law school and I found graduating, I did a clerkship with the courts. Um, I naturally had a tendency, I went into litigation instead. I went to trial work. So my background really was in trial work um, and uh, how to advocate on behalf of people. I did civil criminal litigation in private practice. I, uh, I also uh, did business formations. And so uh, this, but my, this idea of, of family legacies was always in the back of my mind, always wanting to go in that direction. The law being a real jealous mistress as it is, especially trial work, has a tendency to kind of just keep pulling your way in one direction. But so I decided I had two choices. I either I'm going to stay in and change it from within or I could uh, uh, walk away. Okay. So what I decided was I wanted to, to enter into other areas. So I entered into uh, uh, working with nonprofits, uh, teaching, uh, and doing business uh, mentorship. Okay. And so uh, for a period of time, I didn't do anything with was related to practice of law. But here's where the story gets comes into full circle. So I told you about my, my parents. Uh, they were not wealthy. They didn't have a whole lot of wealth. And this is the real misnomer when you're thinking about estate planning, this idea of estate planning, which we'll get into probably, is that people think that's only for the very wealthy or the rich. And it's not. It's for everyone. And I can attest to you right away, you know, directly that my parents were not rich. They had a home, uh, a family residence, like most people in Hawaii. And maybe they had a few shares of property from, from their families on the outer islands. So they paid an attorney really good money. And uh, although they, they had this beautiful document, and, uh, but ultimately it did not, that document itself, which was a trust, which was a will, which had all the bells and whistles, did not do what they, my parents had wanted it to do, okay? And basically, um, long story short, is that those properties did not go to, as, uh, to the individuals or beneficiaries as they directed. Um, so um, when I, I had unfinished business, I wanted to come back to the practice of law, but I only wanted to come back if I could design and fashion a practice that was not like my old type of practice, but something that was going to give real great value to the community and to uh, uh, the neighbors, neighborhood, you know, basically the, the, the neighborhood that I grew up in. But I'm not just talking about this one neighborhood because what I found was that a lot of people can create documents, transactions, and all that, one-off transactions, and put it on the shelf, and that's great. But it doesn't, like my parents, it doesn't come out to what you had intended it to do. And that's the real travesty. So I made it my, my goal and my focus that I want to create a practice that would, first of all, bring it back to the community, make it uh, accessible. And I decided that I wanted to focus on estate planning because, as I, I just mentioned, that I found that estate planning was really for everyone and not just for a limited so few. What's the, like the number one or top problem that, that you're seeing well the, i've been practicing for over what's it going on now 15 years maybe 15 years and um so and i ran in that time i've been an uh, associate attorney worked for, for someone else i've been a, uh, a private practice attorney i worked in government i've run my own small business uh, practices with another attorney as well as myself. And during that time, I have seen um, all the different variations of how you serve individuals, okay, your clients. And in different practice areas, it's difficult to really give a one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of times a one-on-one -on -one type of relationship. Right? And so it's not really great feelings that come out. And so the way that you usually handle a lot of those cases is by either contingency or you handle them with a, a billable hour. And so um, billable hours is those tenths of the hour that you have to bill as an attorney. And so that can range anywhere from the type of the, the amount of time that you're spending preparing paperwork 
to the amount of, to a phone call to an email. And what is the result of that was really that it froze the client relationship, with the attorney, because uh, you can imagine that um, as an as a client. You don't want to pick up the phone and talk to your attorney, even if it's just to get a status update, um, and because you're th you're knowing that your attorney is billing you, and so therefore you don't want to you want to save your money, you want to save that billing time, and so I decided that I I want to do away with all of that. I didn't want I, in order to get a free exchange, and bring back that idea of a trusted advisor, uh, an attorney, uh, a go-to attorney, um, that I needed to take away the, any areas that was going to block that. And so to distinguish, you know, this practice from how most attorneys do practice, uh, we have to get rid of, of that billable hour idea where every time you're, you're on the phone, the clock is ticking. You know, um, in my practice, I don't really, I don't even have, I don't have software or any uh, device to be able to take the take time. Um, uh, and to, to kind of control that. Uh, so um, that really frees up not only for the client, but also for myself. And so those type of things, it's more of a, a relationship again, in, in it's really uh, building relationships again, providing value and uh, bringing that idea of a trusted advisor back. Comes, so when it comes to, um, again, estate planning, what, what would you say is different about how maybe things that you're doing now versus the traditional way of estate planning. Is there a difference? Um, what is the difference? Well, I think um, the traditional practice of estate planning is based on that time clock uh, for the attorney is to make sure that there's billable hours that you are bringing in, especially with the larger type of firms. And I'm not seeing, there's no real judgment on it because this is uh, how the practice has evolved as a profession and the only way that they really can provide value and get compensated for it and they are businesses is through is through getting paid for the work and when you have a high overhead you have a lot of people on your payroll you're going to have to create a substantial type of income stream okay i understand that this is business 101 and so there's i always said this that there's two things that are challenging an attorney in in my practice it's the practice of law and then the business of law and they those two are not good bedfellows they don't get along well okay um, the profession is dictated by one type of standard and then the business is dictated by another and anyone who has gone in business for themselves understand this whole set of needs and circumstances at a business and you have a different uh you have uh, different strategies that you have to go through in order to get those things done okay so most attorneys will 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 try to do things that has been passed on to them which is like billable hours uh and um flat fee arrangements contingent fees so what i wanted to do was basically say okay we're not going to if i'm not going to keep track of the time um, again, I'm, I'm still in the business, but I want to give value. I want to create value. Um, so the basic way to do it is kind of trim off a lot of the fat and make it valuable for both, both the client and, and, and the attorney. And so we do things with arrangements, which is strictly all flat fee arrangements. So that takes away the billable hour type of idea, but it also uh, allows the client to be able to fully expect uh, and understand what they are getting into and getting out of uh, the, the legal service. Okay, so the second thing to do and answer your question quickly is that this relationship. Um, many attorneys can just be scriveners, which is an old term for someone who just basically writes up documents. Okay, they put their, their head down, their nose down to the grindstone and they just write documents, contracts, state plans, whatever. And um, I did not want to be a one-off transaction type of attorney again in, with the, the hope of creating relationships building relationships fostering relationships being a, a go-to type of uh, trusted advisor um, the relationship is really what the the value in the the, the whole 
transaction really is, if you want to call it that. And so um, it, I made it a goal, and uh, one of the the missions in this was to create relationships, foster relationships, and like you said, uh, be more of with uh, the idea of serving. Because once you once you do things for the right reasons, you get right results. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so I wanted to kind of touch on at what point does someone have to consider estate planning? Is there like a benchmark, a certain amount of assets? So I would, as I mentioned that, I, I believe estate planning is for everyone. Okay, so that means there is no age minimum, really. I mean, you have to be an adult, obviously, in order to sign your, your any document legal document knowingly and willingly and intelligently. And uh, that's the same is true for how, for anyone who's old, it could be 90 something. Um, you still have to have that presence of mind. The time that you need to start thinking about estate planning is when you're, you're beginning life, you're beginning your, your marriage, you're beginning your young adult life. You're creating your, your assets, you're creating um, your earning income potential okay, and so forth. I just did this uh, will, a will for a young married couple in their 20s. Mm -hmm. um, they haven't even reached one year yet in their marriage. Okay. And so obviously they don't have a home. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not that obvious. Sometimes you just start, you just start with your own home. But they don't have a home. They only have no retirement. Um, I don't even believe they even have life insurance yet. So okay. they have bank accounts scattered and so forth. Now, here's the thing, the misnomer, though. With someone who's opposite to that, who has assets like a home, assets like uh, retirement, life insurance, uh, significant bank accounts, property. And we're not talking about, it doesn't even have to be multi-million. Just to have a home in Hawaii, what's the average, the average home, uh, home worth? About seven hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, the median yeah. home sales yeah. uh, sale price is about yeah seven hundred thousand. Yeah. So, so if you have a home and anything, any assets that are over a hundred thousand dollars, you're gonna you're gonna have to make certain plans because if you don't, it goes through this court process called probate. Okay, and the probate, which is that infamous word that nobody wants to go through because it involves the court and the judge making decisions. And we can talk a little bit more detail about probate, but getting back to that young couple, they have none of those things. However, an estate plan can simply uh, include not only your last will and testament, okay, which is basically lays out in writing uh, your intent and your wishes as it pertains to your maybe your husband, your wife, as far as any of your assets or property and you have any time. but it also includes things such as your power of attorney your health care directive your final disposition which is your wishes at your death okay it could also include guardianship and conservatorship um, type of issues so those basic things really anyone can should have actually okay they should have at basic level uh, when we talk about wills that's the thing. Wills can, any part of estate planning tools can cover wills, guardianships, powers of attorneys, uh, bank accounts, your life insurance, your retirement, real estate ownership, of course, uh, and even today, digital and electronic assets, okay? But if you don't have any, anything that is written while you are alive, what's going to happen is that someone is left to going to have to figure this stuff out. When you do pass or you become uh, disabled, because no one likes to think about that when they're alive, right? That's not the thing we think about. We think about yeah. living. We think about what's going to happen tomorrow and the day after, the day after. Or we think now, just beneficiaries are, are good enough on my bank statements or life insurance policy. Yes. And, and at one level, they're okay. Even your life insurance policy. But what we don't think about, especially when you throw in the pot now, okay, the young married couple, they're going through all those seasons that we went through, you and I, and many, many young married couples with, and you have children. Okay, you, start, you start having children, one, two, three, four, 
Five? How many now, Tanya? Six? <laughs> Five. <laughs> okay. Five as well. And so now the thinking goes, the strategy starts to change a little just from you and your husband, which is a pretty simple discussion. If I go first, you get everything I have if, well, for most. And a will can address all those things too. But if you have children, now you're talking about your beneficiaries. What happens if one of the parents become disabled? Okay, now, okay, we can have something that directs the surviving spouse to take over, okay? Now, what happens if they both become disabled? What, if they, what happens if they both die? Because especially in today's climate, we know that you don't have to reach the age of 90 years old in order to become disabled. Yeah, that's very real today. That's the thing. We do not know when or where or what's going to happen to us tomorrow. Okay. Um, so, because who's going to make those, those, uh, those decisions? Is it going to be your, your children? Is it going to be your parents? Is it going to be your, your even if you're of the age, your, your grandchildren? Who's going to make that, those decisions? So while you're able to do it, and even better yet, the earlier you are, you can start thinking about those type of things so that you can have a plan in place that will be able to address all those things for the loved ones. Because really, when we talk about estate planning, it has nothing to do about the individuals, really. It's about, because they're not going to be there. It's going to be about who they left behind. What I look at myself again, like I, I'm talking about this, uh, being the go-to advisor, I look at myself primarily also as an educator. I have a background in education. I was teaching law at, at one time as well. And I love that aspect of, of, of being an educator. So I, I create a basic uh, two-step two process before when you, when you, uh, if you get, uh, if you get referred to me or you call my office, okay? Where you don't just show up. So there's some homework that has to be done. It begins with discussing on the phone your needs, first of all, and seeing whether or not I'm a, I, I can address those things. And I believe if after assessing on the telephone conversation that I can, I will set an appointment up probably about two weeks from that time, two weeks time, because what I will be sending out is a, what's called like a pre-meeting package and that's going to include a file worth of instructions and information about myself, as well as uh, uh, assessment and inventory sheet where you're going to be able to gather documents during those two weeks' time of all of your different assets that you may have or you may not have. Okay, where It's not about making an idea of that, what you should have at that time. It's about what is your status right now? Because the discussion is going to talk about where you are now and then where do you want to be or need to be for your, your family and your, perhaps your business and your love, your loved ones. Okay. And so we have this, uh, a planning session that's set up first. Okay. By the time we meet at the planning session, then basically we discuss all that's uh, the status of where you're at as an, as an individual, as a married couple, um, as blended family. Uh, so, it's not just because you're married, you can be single, you can be blended, Tra traditional, non-traditional families, okay? These are individuals that, that need to understand what's going to happen after something step. But the only time I can take a full uh, understanding and, and analysis of what's going on so we can create a design that's going to fit those needs, then uh, that's going to happen at the session. At that point, we can decide whether or not I'm the right fit or the right individual to design the plan. And that's the second part of the process, okay? And if uh, they decide, the individual decides or the couple decides that uh, they want me to go ahead and design a plan, I will, all right? And, uh, and, and then we can go from that point. So it's a relationship all the way through. And so I take them through this and, and lead the way. And so we, we make sure that during the whole time they're understanding uh, everything that's happening, understanding how state plans work, wills, trusts, if it's the right thing for them, and how all their assets interplay for all of that. And they make the decisions on how that's going to happen. I don't make that decisions. I lead them. I give them the options. And the thing is that if they're looking for someone to just be a one-off transaction, I'm probably not the attorney for them. I could probably tell them go to online and create their own documents. But like I said, I'm going to... Um, uh, I don't believe those things necessarily work 
uh, because they don't address all the nuances and the different values and circumstances of each particular individual that, that comes through. Oh, so it's, um, you really tailor it to the, the client. You really tailor the plan to the, to the client. Absolutely. Instead of the client saying, okay, we need an estate plan. Let's call somebody. Yeah. And then you walk in and you just get it done. However they get it done. You really right. walk through the planning process with them. You, mm -hmm. you discover what it is they're wanting. And then you tailor it, custom tailor it just for them for, for now. And then also within, with their goals for the future in mind as well. That's really interesting. Absolutely. And it all stems out of my direct experience as a young, young boy, young man growing up uh, in a large family with, uh, with parents who are, uh, you know, they're salt of the earth people and uh, understanding that idea of your place and time and your family legacy with your own particular set of family values and what's most important to you, not what's most important to everyone else, especially not what's most important to your attorney. Your attorney should be, you know, facilitating all of that and leading you to the best result that fits your circumstances. And would you say that you're like a lifetime, uh, per, a go-to person that, you know, because life's yeah. going to change, right? So Absolutely. you're in there with them from the beginning of planning to as long as life is changing for them and they've got to reevaluate and make adjustments on the, on the plan. Yes, absolutely. That's, that's the idea of being that, that trusted advisor. Uh, when I grew up and many people grew up back in, in Hawaii and uh, we, we had the same doctor, we had the same, I, the, just to my doctor, delivered all 11 of us kids, brothers and sisters. And he was my doctor oh. from the time I was, he, he, I was, I was giving birth to till in high school, more than likely, and, you know, and he was already retiring by that point. So the idea of bringing back that, that attorney, that, that trusted advisor, that go-to person to come back into the community and be that individual that, that someone can always go to, whether it's for this that or the other really and i'm not saying that i'm going to solve every individual's problem but that's what a counselor does it's the best recommendation at any given time for the circumstances and then you know uh, makes makes those recommendations based on those individuals yeah. particular circumstances that's kind of how i see my role is i want to be that trusted advisor that it's not just one a one a one deal thing right you know it, it's i want to be in there constant because real estate decisions will change or they might have questions for their mm -hmm. kids that I want to advise them on. So I want to be there in my client's mm -hmm. life for as long as they'll have me type of thing. And that's how it, is. it should be in Hawaii, especially for us in Hawaii. We grew up with that idea. I think during this time that we're all staying at home and we're coming back to, you know, the center of things uh, in harsh times and, you know, these circumstances really created though this, this other part of it. It causes us to reflect on what's most important and uh, to see us for who we really are and should be. Yeah. And so I think uh, this is a real good time to really reflect all that. Uh, family legacy is going to be the key uh, moving forward and how, you know, wh and what kind of traditions and values we want to, we want to progress forward in our homeland. So, um, yeah. but I want to thank you so much, Lopaka, for, for doing this for our community for for me for you for just doing this it was really educational and eye-opening um is there any last words maybe an advice that whoever is listening to this you'd want to pass on to them before you go and then also um if people want to contact you and, and find out more what would be the best route to um connect with you well you can see my number at the bottom there is eight six six eight two four one nine five four and that is a, a toll free number and that's uh, probably uh, right now the best way you can want to call me or you can reach me by email and it's real simple Jonathan dot at gmail and so I now have that in the yeah and then i'll I'll include all that contact information in the notes okay. um with this recording so people will be able to look that up so i thank you tanya for you know really sharing those values that i spoke about because i think more business people uh which are truly really the leaders of the community 
and um, are going to be able to lead by example. And having really a servant's heart that you have, because I know you for, for a while, and um, that is the one that, that type of idea is really the thing that's going to make the difference. Because we, we're going to decide on what type of place we live. Yeah. We're going to want, be the ones to decide for, for right now and for our, the future of our children and uh, our communities. So I think it's real important that we come together on this idea and get back to what's most important. So what would be your last words of advice to someone watching? A book, maybe your of, favorite, maybe a favorite book you read that you want to pass on or any, you know, whatever, whatever is just something you want to pass on to someone to add value to them. I kind of threw this, you for a loop, yeah? No, no, this, there is a, <laughs> be the change you want to be. Yes, be the I change, like that. Be the change that you want to be. That you want to see, maybe that's better better way of seeing it. <laughs> be the change you want to see. Yeah. And what's the best way to do that? <laughs> Any advice? By your own example, by leading with your own example, and then carrying forth the best values and traditions and culture that uh, that we know and love, especially here in our homeland. And plan for your family, you know. Plan for your family. You're not doing it for yourself, but you're planning for the ones that you love the most. Aloha, everyone. Again, this is Tanya Aquino, Hawaii Homes by Tanya with Century 21, I Properties Hawaii with Jonathan Lopaka Inciong. The law office called? of Jonathan L. Okay, well, that is Real difficult. <laughs> so simple. <laughs> Very consistent. Okay, everyone. Okay, Tanya. Thank you for listening. At, we can stay on if you want after. Okay. Okay, okay, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Aloha.